Um, okay, hey everyone. I hope it's not my moving around that is causing this flickering. <laughs> I'll go ahead and start the introduction and we'll check the um, connections and hope that they're stable. Um, good evening. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Lisa McVeigh. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at the University of Michigan, and I'm also the chair of our department's DEI committee. Um, I would like to welcome everyone participating in person and virtually to the book launch for the book titled, Can You Hear the Music? My Journey Through Madness. Um, on behalf of the DEI committee, we would like to thank a couple of partners, including uh, our department, the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, as well as the ADA team with the Office of Equity, Civil Rights, and Title IX for supporting the captioning that will be available for this event tonight. Um, we wanna make our event accessible to all participants. So this webinar will have live captions, captioned by Kate Miller with screen line captioning and a transcript will be available. For our audience on Zoom, to enable captions, click show captions on the control bar at the bottom of your screen. You can pull up a full transcript using that button as well. You can also view captions on your phone via the stream text link that was sent to you if you registered via email. Um, please note that there will be a slight delay in captions that are sent via stream text. So during Anne's presentation, I invite participants to send in uh, questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. Of course, if you're in person, you can just raise your hand during the Q&A um, after Anne's presentation. Um, and in-person attendees are invited to stay for a uh, reception that's gonna take place after the presentation and the Q&A conclude. Okay, now I would like to introduce our very special speaker who is engaged in technical troubleshooting at this moment. <laughs> I'll trade places with you after the introduction. Dr. Ann Jeffers. Ann Jeffers is an associate professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Michigan. Her research focuses on computational methods and fire safety engineering with an emphasis on both structure fires and wildfires. She was co-editor in chief of Fire Safety Journal from 2016 to 2018, and she has earned a number of awards, including the National Science Foundation Career Award and the Harry C. Bigglestone Award. She's an advocate for mental health and uses creative writing to teach others what it's like to live with mental illness. Her memoir, Can You Hear the Music? My Journey Through Madness, describes her experience being diagnosed with and recovering from bipolar disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. We are delighted to have you, Anne. I will check those cables now. Thank you, I don't need that. I have this mic here. All right, um, if this does not work out, no worries, um, because it's just a couple pictures uh, and you're not missing a whole lot. Um, and I can share the slides with you later if you wanna see a picture of me when I was a kid. <laughs> so um, welcome to the book launch for Can You Hear the Music? Uh, I'm Ann Jeffers, I'm the author of the book. I'm also uh, a professor, um, associate professor of civil and environmental engineering. Um, and my book tells the story of an academic, myself, um, who loses her mind and eventually recovers. Um, and I'll share an excerpt from the book just now. The Michigan winter sucked me into its abyss with its dismal charcoal days abbreviated by a blackness that seemingly stretched on forever. The darkness, which fell like a curtain on my evening commute and sustained the absence of light until mid-morning, was suffocating. It was like being trapped deep within a pit with only the narrow beam of my van's headlights to show the way. I drove up the long gravel driveway in that unending dark, swerving around potholes as the rabbits started in and out of view like ghosts. I pulled into the garage and took several deep breaths before entering the house. Um, so to appreciate the book that I've written, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the genre of memoir. Um, this is not an academic work. Um, memoir is a genre of creative nonfiction that involves the telling of a story from a person's real life experience. Um, it's not to be confused with autobiography, which is the telling of a person's entire life history. Um, autobiography, if you're familiar, is very dry, very boring, uh, whereas uh, uh, memoir uses literary devices that are commonly used in fiction. Um, so for example, the story has a narrative arc, 
Um, the character development is a main aspect of the writing. Um, the writer uses principles of show, don't tell. Um, and so they use things like dialogue and descriptive narrative um, to illustrate concepts. And in my opinion, good memoir reads like fiction. I aim to write in a style that very much reads like fiction with lots of dialogue and lots of description. It focuses on a very set time period. Uh, so it only covers about a year of my life. And um, it has a very nice narrative arc. Uh, I don't have many long reflections on my childhood. Um, I focus predominantly on that present time period, uh, which took place about 10 years ago. The crux of my story is that I have bipolar disorder. Um, bipolar disorder is um, an illness, a mental illness that is characterized by highs and lows that are referred to as mania and depression. Um, many people are familiar with depression. Um, uh, situational depression is very common uh, when you uh, experience the loss of a loved one, loss of a job, financial difficulties, and things like that. Um, mania is a little bit harder to discern, and I'll try to give you an example here in just a minute. Um, now, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 2013 at the age of 31, but I've had symptoms of the illness for as long as I can remember. Um, to illustrate mania, I will show you this uh, picture of a journal paper that I published uh, back in 2013. Um, one morning I woke up and I had this great idea uh, for a new finite element uh, that I was going to um, derive and, and um, write a paper on. Hmm. And um, I worked around the clock and within a week, I derived the governing equations for this new finite element. Um, I wrote the, the computer code to run simulations. I implemented the formulation in commercial software. I, I ran simulations and I drafted a 20 plus page manuscript that I submitted for publication and it was accepted with minor um, revisions. And I did all this in the same week that I taught my classes and I met with students and I wrote reports to funding agencies. And by the way, I also painted my bedroom and rearranged all my bedroom furniture. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the sense of what mania means to me is it's a period of really intense energy. And when I'm manic, sometimes I can come at something with, with so much energy and so much focus and so much creativity. And it results in something spectacular, like a journal paper. Um, however, mania is not always enjoyable. Um, and uh, it doesn't always result in creative bursts of productivity. Um, in the most severe cases, it can be dangerous. And for people like me, they begin to experience symptoms of psychosis, which means that they may hear or see things that are not really there. They may experience delusional thoughts. I'll share a little bit of background information um, for my book to give you a greater context and appreciation for the story that I'm going to tell, um, but I don't intend to give you any spoilers tonight, okay? I'll save the book for you to read on your own. Um, my aim uh, in writing this book was to give people an understanding of what it is like to experience serious mental illness and to instill in hope, to instill hope in people um, who've been touched by mental illness, whether it's people who are experiencing it themselves or people who have a loved one um, who's uh, experienced mental illness. Um, when I give talks about mental illness, I always share this slide here. And this looks like a, a, an excerpt that was taken directly out of my CV. Um, so you can see that uh, I earned my bachelor's degree in engineering in 2004. And then I went straight to Virginia Tech. I got my master's degree. Um, and immediately after my master's degree, I decided to pursue a PhD. Um, graduated in 2009 with my PhD and came to the University of Michigan and immediately took a tenure track position um, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Within six years, I was promoted to associate professor with tenure, and that's currently where I sit. And when I show this, I always say, you know, this looks like the, uh, the experience of somebody who's incredibly successful, right? Um, this looks like somebody who, who had it together and accomplished all of their degrees in the minimal amount of time and you know, went straight tenure track position you know, at one of the top universities in the country. And what you don't see on this is that um, there were significant hardships that came up during that time period. So for example, when I was a PhD student at Virginia Tech, 
um, I experienced uh, uh, several traumas uh, related to uh, violent events that took place on campus, one of which was the shooting in 2007. Um, what you don't see on my CV is that in 2013, I lost my mind and I was diagnosed with bipolar one disorder. Um, and what you don't see on my CV is that after uh, receiving tenure and being promoted to associate professor, um, my partner and I uh, uh, decided to um, uh, pursue foster care and we adopted two children out of the foster care system. So the, the point is, um, it's okay. Uh, the point is that um, you don't always see what people have experienced, right? You don't see those hidden life experiences and you don't see the trauma that people may have endured. Um, so uh, I want to um, uh, give you some background information um, that, that's not necessarily covered in any sort of detail in my book. And um, my book focuses on a period from 2013 to 2014 where I was, uh, I had lost my mind and I was uh, diagnosed with bipolar one disorder and um, eventually uh, recovered from, from that episode. Um, but like I said, the bipolar disorder was there my entire life. And so um, I'll show you this uh, picture in between uh, on and off flickering. Uh, this is a picture of me as a kid, maybe, I don't know, nine or 10 years old. I had, um, uh, a mullet, uh, which was the style back in the 90s. And I'm sitting there with my um, uh, golden retriever. And see, the thing is, I was born in the 80s, and I had this idyllic ch childhood. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, and she stayed at home with me and my two brothers. And most of my childhood was spent playing on our two-acre lot in southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, my parents were high school sweethearts. They never argued in front of us kids. They loved us unconditionally and impressed upon us the importance of hard work and education. In my mind, they were the model parents. But I was always sensitive. And somewhere around third or fourth grade, I began to experience feelings of melancholy. I would be overcome with a deep sadness, even to the point of crying, at times when I believed I should have been happy. I never told my parents about it. It was just part of who I was. And I had no reason to be sad, so I pushed the feelings aside. The mania became apparent uh, once I reached adolescence. Um, my first manic hallucination that I can remember happened at summer camp when I was around the age of 13 years old. Um, being at summer camp, I wasn't sleeping much. Um, and sleep, lack of sleep is a trigger for mania in people with bipolar disorder. Um, I was laying in the grass. I was totally euphoric. Um, and I was watching the sunset. And as I was laying there looking up at the sky, there was a line that came across the sky and it separated night from day. And it just came across the sky like a shade and it came down and it was the most incredible thing I've ever experienced in my entire life. Absolutely beautiful. And again, I was manic, I was euphoric. Um, and it was the most incredible thing. And I, I'm a very scientific person and I never once thought that there was no physical explanation for what it was that I had experienced, but I knew something was off. And so I never told anybody about it. I just sort of kept it to myself. Later, um, as I sort of uh, proceeded through uh, my teenage years, um, my family and I lived in Germany. Um, I started sneaking out at night and sometimes wandering the apple orchard near home. Sometimes I would even go into the, the town and go to the local bar and have a drink at the age of 14. Um, and you can read about that experience in my essay, First Brush with Psychosis, which was published in Open Minds Quarterly a couple years ago. Um, but then after I returned to the States, I got in with the party crowd. Um, I was drinking at every chance I could get. I started experimenting with drugs. And I really wanted to just numb the sadness that had become part of my everyday experience. In the field of mental health, this behavior is called self-medicating. And I, I did it every opportunity that I could get. Um, I was reckless as a teenager and I drove recklessly when I would drive to school or anywhere, sometimes even driving on the wrong side of the road. My friends knew that I was wild, but other than that, my parents had no clue that any of this was going on. Through it all, I excelled academically in nearly every subject I attempted. As a high schooler, I made it a point that I could party, but not on a school night. 
So no partying on a school night, took my academics very seriously. And uh, that took me all the way through college, to be honest. Um, at the age of 19, I met my partner, Susan, who's here in the audience today. Um, and uh, she's now my wife. Um, we navigated college and grad school together and we had many great adventures and shared countless laughs. I struggled with coming out during that time, but we managed to make it through. After Susan and I moved to Michigan, I became more open about my relationship with Susan and we welcomed our first child into the world. Through it all, I continued to experience ups and downs in my mood. And in grad school, um, I became even more serious about my studies. However, while I was in grad school, the trauma of three violent incidents on campus had a cumulative effect on my well being. Most people remember the shooting in 2007, but many don't remember that a prisoner escaped near campus the year prior, prompting a manhunt and resulting in the death of a police officer and a security guard. Most people don't remember that there was also an incident in 2009 in which a man brutally killed another, brutally killed another student in the coffee shop on campus. While I didn't witness any of these events firsthand, they happened in places that I frequented. With regards to the shooting, my department lost several students and a faculty member. I didn't know any of them personally, but I attended their memorial services and I grieved for the, the, my community's loss. I experienced nightmares and paranoia following the shooting, but I never sought treatment for any of it because I didn't feel I was entitled to any sort of help. There were so many who had experienced so much worse. I just buried the trauma. I buried the trauma just like I buried the bipolar symptoms. So you can imagine that that was the perfect recipe for uh, when I arrived at the University of Michigan. Um, I took a tenure track position at the University of Michigan and I maintained my fear of classrooms and other public spaces. I was always looking for the exit in the room. I was always keeping track of who was coming and who was going. Um, I experienced mood episodes frequently, but I buried myself in my work. And I had many successes during those early years, including publishing a number of papers, securing a million dollars in research funding, and receiving awards for my teaching, research, and service. In 2013, though, my wife and I were trying to get pregnant with a second child, and I was seeking fertility treatments. And sort of the, the stress of that experience um, prompted me to start having uh, more pronounced mood swings, as well as auditory and visual hallucinations. In addition to that, I had PTS, post-traumatic stress flashbacks. Um, I was severely paranoid pretty much every time I set foot on campus, and I had delusional thoughts off and on. I pushed my way through the symptoms though, but the experience was quite scary and it was quite isolating. And it took a year before the symptoms mostly subsided. And it was probably another year before I became fully functional again. Um, so I, the reason that I kept all of this hidden and pushed it all down was partly because I didn't feel I was necessary, that I was um, uh, worthy of receiving treatment um, but partly because I was on the tenure track and I could have lost my job if it had gotten out that I was having symptoms of psychosis while I was on the tenure track. So as part of my recovery, um, I wrote a book about it uh, and it's entitled, Can You Hear the Music? My Journey Through Madness and it releases today on Amazon. Um, I wrote the book because I needed to make sense of the things I had experienced th during that year long period where I was most ill. I needed to express my thoughts on paper and I needed to close that chapter of my life. While I was ill, I read many mental health memoirs, but I found that the experiences that were reported were so much milder than anything that I had experienced. I resolved to document my experience to help others who find themselves in similar situations. I shared the first chapter with my therapist very early on. I had this great idea, I'm gonna write a book and I wrote a chapter and then I was like, I need a reality check. And I gave it to my therapist and I said, you know, can you take a look at this? Does this make any sense? And she said, this is really good. Um, this could really help people. And so that's what uh, prompted me to, to move forward with writing the entire book over a period of several years. Obviously I have a day job. Um, this is something that I did in the wee hours of the morning on my phone, on a Google doc, um, you know, just writing and writing and writing um, until eventually in the past year, I became serious about publishing it. 
Um, in the end, well, so although my book cont contains triggering material, like I said, I've experienced trauma, um, and and I don't shy away from that in uh, uh, in my writing. Um, and I also don't shy away from difficult topics like psychosis, uh, suicidal ideation, um, and mass trauma in general. Um, I really do believe it can help those who are affected by mental illness understand some of the harsh realities of what it's like to live with mental illness. Um, so in the end, the book that I wrote is the book that I needed to read when I was most ill. And it validates um, my experience and ultimately it is a story of hope. So there is a happy ending. I'm standing here today. I can tell you that, that the ending is a really good one. Um, okay, so uh, th there's a quote up here um, that is uh, by Sylvia Plath, which says, I write only because there is a voice within me that will not be stilled. And this very much was true for me in the writing of this book. Um, Sylvia Plath is an author that I relate to um, due to her own experiences with mental illness. And The Bell Jar was one of the books that I found solace in when I was most unwell. Um, if you haven't read The Bell Jar, uh, it's sort of like a fictional memoir uh, about her experience with uh, de depression and um, uh, hospitalization. And as many people in this room are engineers, so am I, and engineers like data. And I approached this uh, project in a very systematic manner. Um, so what's up here on, on the screen uh, is um, uh, the data that I collected in a mood chart. I had an app on my phone that was called eMoods Bipolar Tracker. And every day I would log, what is my level of depression? What is my level of mania? What is my level of anxiety? Am I having symptoms of psychosis? What medications am I taking? And then I'd write a little note next to it as far as what, what happened that day. And so I, I had pages and pages of data. I'd print these, these reports up and I'd give them to my therapist and I'd say, here, you know, this is, this is how I'm doing. Um, and, and that's sort of how I approached it. Um, and, and so at the end of it all, I had all this data that I had collected. Um, in addition to that, I also kept a journal and I wrote in there when I was feeling anything. Um, and so I had that to sort of supplement these uh, reports. And so I like to think of this as um, a, a research study where N equals one, mm -hmm. one, one subject, right? But you know, all this data, um, qualitative, quantitative, you, know, you name it. And, and all that data uh, helped me craft the arc of the story that uh, ultimately appears in the book. Um, in my book, there are several uh, themes that come to light. Um, bipolar disorder, uh, uh, I'll just sort of uh, mention it this way. Bipolar disorder is considered a serious mental illness um, along the lines of major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. Um, and uh, it, when dealing with serious mental illness, um, there are a lot of factors that come into play. Um, and I'm going to talk about each of these in a little bit of detail. Um, so we've got stigma. Um, the symptoms themselves can be quite a challenge. Um, if you're similar to me and you have trauma history, that can complicate things. Um, substance use. I already mentioned that I uh, self-medicated, um, and that was part of my experience uh, before uh, treatment. Um, and then uh, as part of treatment, um, taking medications is part of my reality uh, and also staying in therapy. Um, and so uh, I'll start by talking about stigma. Um, so how many of you have seen the movie The Shining? Of course. Like everybody, it's a classic, right? But it's The Shining and pretty much any movie in the horror genre is rife with stigma. Right, And so this is what was in my head when my doctor told me that I had bipolar disorder with psychotic features. I thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to kill my family. And the reality is it's, it's not that at all, okay? Psychotic is a term that's used to describe somebody who's experiencing symptoms of psychosis, meaning that you see or hear things that are not really there, meaning that uh, you, you may have delusional thoughts or something like that, or some paranoia. But at the end of the day, you're not a danger to anybody. And so that was something that I had to overcome um, in, in, in my experience. Um, and, and actually, that was one of the hardest lessons that I had to learn. And, and in fact, in the book, you'll see that I go, I go back and forth on this uh, again and again. You know, it's, oh, I'm crazy. I'm losing it, you know, and, 
you know, I, I don't know what the future holds. And I would research and research and research till my fingers were blue, trying to find an answer that would tell me that I, if I have psychosis, I'm going to be fine, that it's treatable, you know, and I just, I, I couldn't quite uh, get my head around that. Um, and so that, that was one of the barriers that I had to um, treatment. Um, in addition to uh, symptoms, um, when I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, um, uh, so what I want to say is when I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, um, I was actively symptomatic and I was going to work and I was pretending like everything was okay. Um, my symptoms included mania, depression, and psychosis, but also anxiety, suicidal ideation, and post-traumatic stress symptoms. And one of the things that happened through the course of that year that I was really unwell, a student came into my class and sat down. And on any normal day, you would think nothing of it, right? Students come and go in classrooms all the time. But for me, because I was unwell, I immediately thought that I was in danger and that this was it, this, this was it. Um, and so uh, after that experience of, um, I, I basically ended class early, uh, if you're curious, it's in the book, but I ended class early and um, I went to my car and I had a panic attack and then I maintained a fear of teaching for like the rest of the year, um, but I did it anyways. And um, uh, so, so, that cold day in January in 2014, teaching became nearly impossible. Um, and so uh, when it comes to symptoms, right, it's having that anxiety, having that paranoia, uh, having panic attacks, having, you know, all that stuff and, and trying to keep it cool at work was incredibly, incredibly hard. Um, and I guess one of the things that I ta do talk about in my book, and it, it may be triggering for some people, um, but I think it's important for us to have a conversation about it. It's the suicidal ideation. Um, it's nothing to gloss over when we talk about bipolar disorder, um, because with bipolar disorder, something like one in five people with the illness lose their life to suicide. That's a crazy statistic to think that that is the, the risk to my life. And that uh, more than 50% of the people who have it attempt suicide at some point in their life, right? It's a very dangerous illness. Um, and so, you know, for, for me, um, it, it was very troubling to have th those thoughts um, coming up at a time when, when I really uh, didn't um, have any reason or any explanation for it. Um, and for me, uh, what it took was um, a switch of medication that helped me overcome that. And voila, I don't have those experiences anymore, you know? So for me, it was lithium uh, crushed that that uh, uh, risk for me completely. Um, here you can see a quote uh, uh, from my book, and I'll just read it to you. Um, but basically, um, it says, if I could sleep, I at least knew that someday, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next week, but someday my mood would change and I would be able to see the world in color again. And so my survival strategy was to just sleep through it because my bipolar disorder is rapid cycling. And so over the span of a week or two, I'm a different person. You know, I may be depressed, but I know I'm gonna come out of it and I'm gonna be manic in a couple of weeks, you know, and, and it's vice versa. You know, if I'm manic, I know I'm gonna end up being depressed after that. And so because of the way, the pattern of my moods, I was able to sort of say, okay, I can wait this out. I just need to sleep through this depression. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be okay. Um, okay, so moving on um, to uh, self-medicating. Um, self-medicating with drugs and alcohol is incredibly common for people with mental illness. Um, there's a national com comorbidity study that found that 51% of the people um, who had a substance disorder at some time in their life also met the criteria for a mental disorder at some point. And in most cases, the mental disorder preceded the substance disorder, meaning that many people who experience mental illness um, will turn to drugs and alcohol as a way to sort of keep the symptoms at bay um, and, and make it through that as sort of a, a survival strategy, um, although it's, it's a very dangerous one to, to get involved in. Um, and so, you know, it's not surprising that I turned to alcohol um, at many points in my lifetime, and it's something that I still struggle with today. 
Um, I'm still struggling to moderate my alcohol intake and not uh, try to, to self-medicate. Um, as my mental health became unstable, um, the post-traumatic stress symptoms um, became unstable. I told you about the experience of having that student come into my class. Um, and uh, what happened was that I didn't feel I was deserving of any sort of treatment for the, the trauma because I was not on campus the day of the shooting, right? So even though I was having nightmares and flashbacks and whatever, I, I wasn't there. So like, how could I possibly have those symptoms? And so I, I pushed it aside and pushed it aside and pushed it aside. And, and um, that is not something that, um, uh, that I should have done or that I should have thought that I had to do. Um, and so there is, a, you know, I, I speak um, to a, a nursing class every semester now on the topic of trauma and I tell them my experiences. And the message that I'm trying to convey now is that um, you can experience trauma and you can have symptoms, um, post-traumatic stress symptoms. And regardless of whether you, you, you are, are um, uh, categorized as having a diagnosis of PTSD or not, it doesn't matter, right? At the end of the day, what matters is you are struggling, you are suffering, and you can benefit from from getting help. And so that's sort of what I'm what I'm trying to do is to just try to sort of normalize that we have these instances of mass trauma, and um, uh, it is okay for people to to have symptoms, and it is okay for people to get help for those symptoms. Um, and this is particularly important because. Um, you know, here at the University of Michigan, we've had um, two uh, mass shootings very close to home. So in 2021, there was the Oxford High School shooting. And then just this year, there was the, the shooting at Michigan State University. And that impacted our community tremendously, you know. And so I think that um, we, we need to be mindful of that as, as uh, uh, faculty members, uh, many of you in the, the audience here are faculty. Um, we need to be mindful of that, um, and we need to think about how we can create an environment that's going to be supportive and that's going to help people get help. Um, okay, so there are two last themes that I do want to talk about tonight. Um, and uh, the first, uh, well, they both have to do with treatment. Um, and so for me, um, I need medication um, to regulate my moods. I need medication to uh, treat the symptoms of psychosis um, and to keep me even, you know, and, and so that is something that is, that is part of my treatment. Um, and the thing that I was not prepared for was that psychiatry is an imperfect science and there's so much trial and error associated with it. And it's not like you just take one medicine and then you're like miraculously cured right? You take a medicine and then you have side effects. You take another medicine and then uh, it doesn't work. And then you take another medicine and that one doesn't work. And then you take another medicine and then things get even worse. And then, you know, and, and it's just back and forth of trying this and trying that. And over the course of that year, I tried, I think, six different antipsychotic medications, two mood stabilizers, and two different antidepressants before I found a combination that worked. Okay. And I was unprepared for that. I thought, I'm having symptoms of psychosis, I'll take an antipsychotic medication and I'll be all better. And um, the reality was that it took me a year before we actually found something that worked. And one of the realities that um, uh, people may not realize is that with each medication, there's all kinds of side effects, right? There's weight gain, there's cloudiness and fog, brain fog, uh, fatigue, uh, appetite change, worsening of symptoms and so on. And so, um, you know, it's, it, when, when I think about bipolar disorder, I really think about it from the perspective of I have a disability, right? And the disability is not just the symptoms that I experience, but it's also the treatment and the fact that I have good days and that I have bad days, the fact that I have to go through medication changes sometimes. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, that is something that, like I said, I was completely not prepared for. Um, and the cloudiness and fatigue, I will tell you, makes it really hard to do the job that I, I do, right? You know, to be a professor and to be on all the time, to teach my classes and uh, to write papers and review proposals and, and all that stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to do. Um, and then uh, the, the last uh, uh, theme that I'll bring up here um, is uh, the, the therapy. 
Um, and I'll start by saying that I hated therapy when I first tried it. Um, I was a graduate student at Virginia Tech the first time I sought any sort of help. And it was not for the trauma, it was actually for anxiety. Um, and I had this uh, horrible um, school therapist uh, who said, you know, I, tried, I, I just went to this seminar and I learned this hypnosis technique. Do you mind if I try it on you? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I don't know, you know, like, and then she gets me in like, you know, deep hypnosis, whatever. And then she's like, well, 50 minutes is up. Uh, I don't have time to get you out of this properly. So like you're on your own. And I felt like she had taken a stick and like jabbed me in the brain. Um, it was an awful, awful experience. And so I never went back and I never wanted to go to therapy again. Um, it was just, it was horrific. Um, and so, you know, I started in therapy um, in 2013 because I was in a really bad shape and I had nowhere else to go, right? And so I stuck it out, even though I hated my therapist. I thought she was terrible. And uh, she's the same therapist that I still see 10 years later, right? So <laughs> she actually turned out to be exactly what I needed, you know, but, but therapy, it takes time. Somebody once explained it to me that it's like um, dating where you have to try many different therapists before you find the one that's actually right for you. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's um, something to be said for, for, for that, that, that it takes persistence to find the right therapist. It takes persistence to find the right doctor. It takes persistence to find the right medication. Um, and so it, it's, uh, it, it's really an exhausting experience. Um, okay, so I will uh, sort of wrap it up here in the next few minutes. Um, I do want to say that, um, so, start by saying that uh, this whole experience with having mental illness has had a significant impact on my career. Um, I made it through tenure without any problems, right? You saw my timeline. Six years, I went straight through. I, my, my letters of evaluation were like phenomenal. In closed case, you know, deserving of tenure. Um, but you have to keep in mind that tenure is the culmination of work that's completed during that whole six year period. A lot of it in those first few years. And I had a number of successes when I was getting started. So even though I was ill, uh, four or five years into to being an assistant professor, I still had already sort of got myself on a trajectory that was going to be successful. Um, I will say that um, the masking of my symptoms caused me to burn out. Um, you know, hiding something like this for as long as I hid it um, was incredibly exhausting. And I'm not one who likes to keep secrets. And so it sort of weighed on me like extra. Um, because, you know, I, I felt like I was um, hiding something from my boss or something, although I don't technically have a boss because <laughs> it's a university. <laughs> I have a department chair, but, he, you know, department chair is not my boss. Um, so um, so, so it, it, it basically caused me to burn out. And so what happened was I got tenure and then I crashed um, and and I was exhausted from from all of that. And um the timing was was actually good because we were uh, in the process of adopting two kids from the foster care system. Um, and if you know anything about foster parenting, um, it is incredibly challenging. Um, it's it's probably the one of the hardest things I've dealt with in my life is, is being a foster parent. Um, and so, uh, you know, that that was exhausting. And so I could use that sort of as an excuse that like, you know, I'm taking care of myself, I'm rebuilding myself. And I'm focusing on my family during this time. And so that sort of all sort of played out nicely for me. Um, the result was that I have a gap in my research career, though. So if you do look at my CV now, you do see that there's starting to be a gap. Um, and and it's, it's becoming obvious. Um, and honestly, I could care less because, um, <laughs> you know, life happens. And I think it's important for people to see that life does happen to people who are incredibly successful, too. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm I'm just moving forward, um, doing doing my own thing. Um, I'm starting to close that gap, though. You know, I just got an NSF grant this year, I'm rebuilding my research program. Um, you know, and I'm at a good good point. Got this book, closing that chapter. Um, you know, I'm working on a textbook. You know, all kinds of good stuff coming up. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's I'd say it's I'm successful now, um, in a way that is meaningful. 
Um, I, I do want to mention a little bit about what recovery looks like for me. Um, so I mentioned already I need medications and therapy. Um, that's I, I need that. Um, I can't avoid it. Um, I now prioritize sleep in a way that I never did before. Um, I try to keep stress low and I acknowledge my limits. Um, so I realize I can't do it all anymore. Um, and I, I don't need to do it all. I, I do what I can um, and that's good enough. Um, I'm very careful with how I plan my travel. Um, and just to illustrate how successful I am right now, uh, I was able to uh, go to Japan and come back and I'm still doing okay, you know? And that's something that I couldn't have said 10 years ago. So the, the time difference, the lack of sleep, the stress of traveling, um, all that stuff, I was able to manage it by giving myself a day off while I was traveling, give myself a couple of days off when I got back to the US um, and then just sort of taking it easy. Um, I did have a major proposal to do during that time, but I got it submitted and we're, we're good, right? So, so it, it was, it's fine. Um, and and that, that is, is, is amazing in my opinion. Um, and then another thing that I'm learning to do is uh, how to set boundaries between work and home. Um, this one I, I I I struggle a little bit with, um, but but I'm I I think I've found a, a, something that works for me, which is working a few hours in the morning, taking a nap, working a few hours in the afternoon, spending time with the kids, and then if I need to, working in the evening. Right. So like I break my day up. It's not nine to five. It's like you know nine to nine, but it, you know there's several breaks in between there. You know, so my day looks different. Than I ever thought it would, um, but it's it's working for me, and and I'm getting a lot more done now than what I did um, uh, when I was unwell. Um, so okay, to sort of finish up here, um, I had a gap in my career, but I'm rebuilding things, and I have new passions for mental health advocacy and disability justice. Uh, I just had a meeting today with the provost uh, to talk about disability uh, stuff on campus, which is really uh, rewarding to to be able to be part of that conversation. Um, and then I, you know, taking on other leadership on campus, I, I chair the Rackham Committee on Graduate Student Mental Health and Wellbeing. Um, you know, so I'm able to take my knowledge of mental health and apply it to uh, something that's going to benefit students all across campus. Um, new research directions. So, so I, I, I switched gears and instead of studying structures and fire, I started moving into the wildfire space because I figured if I have to rebuild my research program, I may as well do something interesting and something that's going to benefit people. And, and of course, we can't deny that the wildfire problem is not important. Um, and so that's what I'm currently doing work on. Um, better self-care, more balanced. And I, um, at the end of the day, would say that I am a happy individual. Um, now I, I finish. Um, let's see, let's skip those slides. Um, I, I finish up by showing this plot here, and I, I'm I'm kind of sad that the projector hasn't been uh, cooperating tonight, and I, I hope it's not causing any headaches. Um, but this is a, a plot uh, that has on the horizontal axis um, ranging from no mental illness to severe mental illness. Right? We know that mental illness is on a continuum. Uh, people can have mild conditions, more severe conditions, you know, whatever. Um, and on the vertical axis is mental health. And you can have good mental health or poor mental health. And so the idea is that, okay, maybe I'm somebody who's down here on the, the bottom, bottom left quadrant here, you know, severe mental illness with poor mental health. You know, that's where I was 10 years ago. That's where I was when, when the book was written. Um, and I've been able to move myself up into the good mental health space. Um, but my point is that anybody in this room has mental health, right? That then you should be worrying about it and you should be thinking about it. Um, and so regardless of whether you have a, a diagnosis or not, um, you should be prioritizing mental health, um, getting sleep, you know, not overdoing it with drugs and alcohol, um, uh, eating well, getting exercise, all, all that stuff helps you with your brain and, and your well-being. Um, so I, I want to leave you with that. And I want you to think about how you can uh, do a better job of taking care of your own mental health. Um, okay, so that brings us to the end here. Um, so uh, the book launches today. Um, I, I'm totally <laughs> enthusiastic about it.
Um, it's available on Amazon um, in ebook and print formats. I've got some print copies with me tonight. If you want to stick around, be happy to, to sell you one and, and sign it for you. Um, I do have a small request, which is that I'm an indie author. I, this is not published through a, a major publishing house or anything like that. I publish this all on my own through my own LLC that I called Mad Engineer Press. Um, so this is, this is my effort. And so as an indie author, um, if you read the book, please do leave a review on Goodreads, Amazon, whatever, because that helps me um, get, get more attention. Um, and then lastly, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge all the people who um, uh, contributed to this uh, little project. These are all people that I um, hired uh, to, to do some work for me. Um, but basically, uh, the publisher, Mad Engineer Press, which is just me, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, my editors, uh, Elizabeth Denoma, Lisa Rose, um, proofreader Deidre Soso, and uh, cover design by Nuno Moreira. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to turn the screen off because I'm tired of seeing the flash. And I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. I think Lisa is going to um, help moderate the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to say just by you sharing this information has been outstanding, right? You really just laid it out there. Um, like I told you earlier, um, I actually am the CEO of a research network of young folks around the country that do science. And, um, you know, I, I do have a family member that's dealing with this illness. And I just wanted to really, because I mean, like she like super smart too. Um, how did your family respond to your diagnosis? My parents have always been supportive of me. Um, so they were supportive, but it was sort of like supportive with a little bit of hesitancy of like, I don't know what you're dealing with. Um, and so um, that, that, that comes out in the book, actually. There's some conversations between me and my parents. And it's like, you know, I'm not sure how my parents are going to take it and, and whatnot. Um, and I mean, at the end of the day, my parents are, my biggest supporters. Um, they're, they're my number one fans. Um, and, uh, you know, if they were here tonight, they'd be cheering me on. Um, but, uh, you know, I think um, that evolved as a result of this experience, right? We became more open. I told my parents more about my experience and how I'm feeling. And they're able to sort of tell me, oh yeah, you know, I, I do have anxiety sometimes and I, I do know what it's like to, to experience depression and, and all that. So, so we're more open and, and better at communicating with one another. Um, but it, at, at the time, I think, you know, it's, it's frightening to hear somebody's dealing with psychosis. That, that word just sounds scary. And I think part of it's the stigma, part of it's just, we, we don't really understand it. Thank you so much um, for your presentation today. Um, uh, I wanted to talk specifically about an experience that you described. Um, so I'm an alumni in the, from the College of Engineering and I work at Disability Services um, doing research you like things. And I wanted to talk about the experience of students figuring themselves out during the time of undergrad or grad, often going through something like trauma, mental illness, or honestly a wide range of struggles, but not understanding what's going on and therefore not being able to seek out the help that they need. And so often faculty and instructors, GSIs, are the ones who kind of see this happening, see this unfolding in front of them. And they can see it you know, impacting their lives, their academic experience, their academic performance. I'm curious what advice that you have for the people who are supporting students are actively figuring out themselves out actively in this process and this struggle of not knowing if it's them or if it's you know mental illness or disability. Yeah, it's incredibly hard. And, and I, I didn't know what I was dealing with until it got out of hand, right? I mean, I, I just pushed it aside. I was like, oh, it's just who I am. Um, you know, not recognizing that this is depression or this is mania or whatever. Um, and so I, I get that um, there, there is a period of sort of figuring out what it is that you're dealing with 
and and what that means for for uh, your your abilities to to continue in schooling and and whatnot. Um, so some people benefit from a leave of absence, but then some people take a leave of absence and then have a hard time coming back. You know, and so like there there's so many um, moving pieces to it, and and I would like to see. Uh, th there's a program that um, I, I wrote, a, wrote a proposal on earlier this year, I think it was, um, building off of the, the clubhouse movement, right, which is, uh, you know, trying to, to, to give students a community and the supports that they need, and if they need to take a leave of absence, getting them back on campus and, you know, things like that. Um, the, uh, uh, we, we, we talked about sort of a college reentry program. We talked about... Um, a stay in college program, right? How, how to support students, you know, through that so that they don't have to take that leave of absence because many students don't have to. Um, so, so I would say it's incredibly hard, but I think, I, I think there are models out there that, that we could employ that would uh, benefit students who are in, in that, that situation. I mean, my interest in, in writing that proposal was for the students who have mental illness. So not just the students who are struggling, but the students who have a diagnosed condition, um, because it, for me, it's like I, I can see, oh, if you're taking medications, if you're doing you know, this, that, all these other factors um, that, that sort of complicate the experience, right? It's not just you have depression, it's you have depression and you're treating it and, you know, dealing with all kinds of other factors if there's trauma involved and things like that. So, like, um, I think... You know, I, I I would like to see universities be more proactive in supporting those students, um, as opposed to just saying mental health. Everybody has mental health, and go take a yoga class. You know, that that's not helping anybody. Um, I, I think there there are students who who really need more support than that. Um, and and so that, that's that's where I come at it from. I, I don't know if this is helpful or answering your question, but that's those are just some thoughts that came up as as you were talking. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. You're awesome. I can't wait to read your book. Thanks. Um, my question is actually the same thing, but from the faculty side. Like you mentioned, you just talked to the provost. What kinds of structural changes, policies that would you like to see here for faculty? Like in your situation, what would you like to see different? Yeah, I would like to see um, leave of absence be something that's more attainable. So, so like, it's sort of like the stopping the tenure clock policy, right? Where it's like we gave it to women so that they could have babies and then uh, they could leave and then they could come back and continue their career and have an extra year on added on to that period. But then it didn't work because like the people who are writing the letters of evaluation, they're like, well, you know, why did it take her eight years to get tenure or, or you know, and, and, and all these things and and, and why, why didn't she accomplish anything in, in this year? And it's just kind of like, it, it sort of backfired, but I would like to see um, uh, a, a more supportive structure that, that allows for life to happen on the tenure track. Because I, I think, you know, in my case, I had mental illness. Other cases, you know, other faculty are dealing with other things. And, and so I think it needs to be more forgiving. Um, and I, I don't know if it's the, the, the letters of evaluation that are the most problematic because we don't have control over the biases that those letter writers have. Um, you know, I, and I, I don't know what it would look like, but that's what I would, that, that's my hope is that there could be a, a more forgiving probationary period, uh, you know, for, for tenure, but I, I don't know, I haven't talked it out to, with, with the senior folks, the, the administration and whatever to see like what, what they would think about something, you know, that would be a, a different take on tenure, you know, like, I, I don't know what the solution is, but it's, it's a good question. Thanks for writing this book. It's going to help so many people. Uh, I have a question for you, but I have a short comment first for the question that was there, if I may. Yeah, go for um, it. So for those of you who don't know me, I've been a faculty member for 30 years, now I retired serving as a staff member, uh, as an academic coach. And so in that time, those of us old times over here, uh, have seen tremendous change in things like the care center being available. So in terms of the advice for faculty and staff, the nice thing is that we can stay in our lane now, right? And be aware of the resources that are available and be able to channel the, the student to the people who will be able to get them the help that we are not, really shouldn't be giving. Some of us tried to do stuff that maybe it was 
you know, that, that the resources weren't there. So that would be my my comment to your question. But my question to you is, I don't want to wait to read the book. I'm intrigued by the title. Can you tell us a little bit about where the title comes from and what it refers yes, to? Yes, yes. Uh, so the title, um, Can You Hear the Music? Um, so one of my uh, auditory hallucinations is that I hear music sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's a little bit disturbing, but sometimes it's absolutely beautiful. And uh, there's a, a chapter in the book where I talk about um, just laying in bed and, and hearing this music being played on an acoustic piano. And it's just, I wish I could just like write this down and share it with everybody. Um, but I'm not a musician. So like, as soon as I got the pen and paper, it would stop, I'm sure, you know, like, and, and so I just sort of in, enjoyed it. But I think um, the the other piece to it is sort of, it, it's uh, written in a way that's inviting people into my, my experience, right? Can you hear the music um, as opposed to uh, just talking about my, my own experiences as being sort of individual and isolated? Um, but to talk about the care center, um, so the College of Engineering is is really lucky to have the care center um, because it is uh, it provides more support and services than uh, CAPS does. Um, so CAPS is is sort of limited in in what they can do. The care center, you know, can can sort of pull together some some other resources and supports from the college uh, to to help students. Um, uh, and and so I, I think it's. Um, it's it's particularly good, um, and and the wait times are far less than what you see at Caps. Um, Caps wait times can be weeks, you know, and and to tell somebody who's in a crisis situation that you have to wait weeks to talk to somebody is just not feasible. Hi, firstly, thank you for for uh, writing the book, and thank you for sharing your experiences uh, here this evening. They're very. Uh, very profound, so thank you. Uh, so I'm a psychiatrist and I, I've worked with individuals with bipolar disorder uh, uh, throughout my career. And here at the university, there's many faculty that have a range of uh, mood uh, challenges, uh, if you will. You know, one of the things that, that is the apparent in, and that is the struggle that people have with disclosure when to disclose at what stage in their career to disclose to whom they will disclose and how they would you know figure out how to work through you know a very difficult time and these are things that that affect everything from from you know the there are trainees in, in the medical school we have the residents that have a whole host of uh, issues and challenges and the grad students and and also I just want a shout out to the care center here at engineering it's phenomenal we, we really 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 appreciate the work that that is being done here but disclosure how what is your advice to faculty to grad students to people in general in, in terms of um, how to negotiate that challenge of disclosing yeah, I unfortunately have to say, I mean, as we discussed before the talk, um, that stigma is real. Um, and and uh, so any disclosure needs to be weighed carefully. Um, and that is why I, I was advised to not tell the university when I was not tenured was because I, I had no job protection. And if word got out that I was losing my mind, I mean, I'm an academic, my mind is 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 my job. Um, you know, so I think, um, uh, you know, it's it, it's a personal decision, um, but it's one that should not be made lightly. Um, I, I think you you need to look at the pros and cons. Obviously, if it's something that, that comes down to like a leave of absence or something like that, um, or, or needing some sort of accommodation from, from the workplace, um, there are mechanisms to, to pursue that. Um, but but yeah, I think it it, it is uh, it's a really challenging thing to do, and I wish it wasn't that way. Um, I wish I could have just said to my department chair, you know, I'm I'm really struggling, and I think I need to take a year off or something like that. Um, but but I, I didn't feel that I had that luxury or that ability to mm -hmm. to do that. Um, and uh, so. Yeah, it's it's hard, and and that's part of the reason why I wrote the book was because I knew that. I was tenured and that, you know, I, I can do things like that without fear of, of losing my job. Um, but, but there are still possibilities that colleagues could treat me differently, knowing my experience and, and discriminate against me or, or whatever. Um, I'm more of the mindset that like, I just don't care. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And 
and and that's that. Um, you know, so I, I I think this book can help people. I'm going to publish it. You know, like that, that's sort of the the approach that I took. Um, but but you're right. Like I I I wish there was an easy answer, but I I really don't think there is one. And I think it's just something that has to be weighed carefully. So. And congratulations on getting to today. I'm really uh, happy for you, and uh, thank you for sharing uh, with everybody. Um, you, I'm curious, I was thinking about the graph you had that had the gradation of, um, you know, mental health, good and, and poor, and then the mental illness, and thinking about where a lot of people may be on the kind of lighter side of it, yet still really needing to pursue support and have the system support them. And I suspect there's a very, there's maybe, I don't know the data, but there's a high number there. And what are the kinds of things that we can do as institutions to make that um, something that people, you know, pursue and recognize and acknowledge? And I think the thing for for me in in your book, and I have to admit, I have been like jumping around the book. I should like go from the beginning to the end, and I've been jumping around. Again, now I can go from the beginning and because I know I can read it and not be triggered. So that was part of it. <laughs> but um, uh, I I think that um, oh gosh, I just lost that part of the question. Um, but maybe you can answer that part and I'll, I'll remember the other part. Okay. Uh, this, so this, like, the, so how do what we can we do for the folks who are sort of on, on like modestly, the, you the, know, the mild side of things, yeah. but still needing support. Exactly. We, we can provide supports to them, you know, like we can normalize, we can normalize seeking help. Um, we can, I, I, what I've found since the pandemic is, is flexibility is really important for students' well-being. Right, and so being flexible with deadlines and things like that, to the extent that you can be. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and and. Uh, but I guess I mean, like, talk, you know, getting getting that out even more into maybe even if it's a policy stuff. But I know what I was going to say. What I one of the things that really comes through for me is, um, you you've helped us talk about this. You're right. You know, it's from something that's silence to something that we talk about, and so. That's also what I'm thinking about in terms of people kind of over here on this side where they feel, oh, it's just minor. It's not worthy of, of being having any attention mm -hmm. paid to it. And, and I think it's totally worthy because it can move perhaps depending upon which skill you're on. So that, that's really where I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think it's better to talk about these things. Um, and that's why I didn't hold back on anything in my book. It's like, you know, because uh, one of the things with... Um, I mean, in my case, you know, I'm on the far end, you know, severe mental illness, whatever. But, um, you know, for me, I couldn't find other people uh, talking about the psychosis and the suicidal ideation in the, the way that I, I needed to for validation, you know. And so because I couldn't feel that validation, I felt like something was wrong with me, you know. So so I think that, that part of it is just sort of normalizing these conversations and saying, you know, it's okay if you if you have anxiety. It's okay if you have some depression. Um, there are, you know, places to get help, um, and and you know, again, direct them to the care center or whatever. But but um, you know, I, I think that um, you know, one one of the things that that I'm doing with Rackham is uh, reevaluating re their leave policies. Right. So there's a short term leave, but there's not much guidance around it. And so trying to provide students the, the, the ways to navigate that type of experience. So, like, you know, I think that, that there are things we could do structurally with policies and whatnot that could create an environment that, that, that normalizes seeking help and supports those students who do get help, um, whether it's taking a leave of absence and coming back, trying to reintegrate them into the the, the the school um you know the, there's all kinds of pieces to it i think but but yeah i think that's that's what i want to say to answer your question thank you so much for sharing this presentation with us um it's very inspiring your story and i'm particularly interested in the intersection between um mental illness and creativity so you described um in detail how in your manic episode you were able to um, write that um, research paper um, and get a whole lot of things done uh, productivity wise but also like on a creative and the creative side um, 
do you still do creative writing? Like you talked a little bit about the textbook you're writing, but like curious if like um, you do any more creative writing still and um, what is your writing practice? Yeah, so, um, okay, there's a couple things in, in your question that I wanted to talk about. Um, so, so creative writing, yes. Uh, so I, I actually have I, an idea for my next book. Um, I, I haven't started it, but, you know, we'll see if I, I I've got to do, get one thing done before I can, you know, get the next one open. Um, but, but yeah, so I, I do have plans to continue to write because I've learned so much through the process. Um, and it would be a shame to not use that new skill that I have. You know, I, I've, I've really enjoyed writing this book. Um, and, and I've always been a creative person, um, more focused on, on art and music. Um, and this book was my first uh, trip in creative writing. And um, I, I, I just, I really enjoyed it. So, um, but I, I think... Uh, uh, what I want to say is about creativity and mental illness. Um, there is a, sort of a, um, a misconception that um, mental illness means genius and creativity and all that. Um, I think that you can be creative and productive and, and create just as beautiful work uh, and be completely stable. You know, like I don't think you have to sacrifice your well-being to, to have that creative um, urge. And, and I would say, um, you know, for me, I am probably most creative, not when I'm manic, um, but when I'm stable, because if I'm manic, uh, oftentimes my mind is going so fast that I can't do anything productive at all. You know, I just start spinning my wheels. So, so for me to write a paper, that's, a, that's once and for every one productive mania, I've got like 10 that were just completely crash and burn, you know? So it's it's not worth it. Um, and I think being on medications and being stable allows me to be creative um, and and whatever. So, but but I, I think, you know, some of the, the creativity that comes out in the book is, is uh, comes from the intensity of the experience, right? When you, when you live through something that's so intense, um, sometimes you just have to get it out in words. Um, and, and so for me, that's, that's where, where it, it came from. Um, thank you very much for sharing your story and putting it into a book. Um, I was wondering about how you found support, um, given that you didn't want to disclose um, how were you, you know, as someone who has bipolar and is open about my condition, and it's still very, very difficult for me to go day to day, I can't imagine living in silence and not being able to um, be able to be open, more open about it. So what were some of the supports that you had, given that you weren't able to disclose in a more public sphere? Um, and how would you how does that continue even on today? Yeah, that's a good point. So I will say one thing, um, which is I was afraid of disclosing to my employer, but I still went to the university's uh, faculty and staff counseling center. I, I just, I had to trust the system that they weren't going to like disclose to my department that, that I was going there for help. And I went there once and they said, you know what, you've got a lot going on here, more than we can help you with. And they referred me out to somebody. Um, and that's how I found my current therapist. Um, I think uh, as far as supports during the time period covered in the book, they were very much lacking. The only person that I could go to when I would have some bizarre experience was my therapist. And um, and I didn't like her, right? You know, so <laughs> but that was that was it. But she could she at least had a, a doctorate in psychology. So like, you know, I had to trust that. Um, but you know, so. But but nowadays I'm I'm open with everybody. I'm open with my kids. I'm open with my wife. I'm I'm open with with everybody in this room. Everybody knows sort of my 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 experience in my my life, and and it's a much better feeling. You know, it's it's good to not feel as alone and and isolated. Um, and so I think community is important, and I, that brings me back to Clubhouse. Right? Is like, um, uh, uh, Clubhouse is is a, a program for, for if you're not familiar, I'm referring to Fresh Start Clubhouse, which is a nonprofit in Ann Arbor um, that supports adults with serious mental illness. And um, they provide 
social supports. It's like a social network, uh, uh, people that you could just get together with and, and everybody has mental illness. So like, you know, if you're having a bad day, like, you know, everybody gets it, you know? And uh, I started volunteering with Fresh Start um, in 2015, I think. So as I was recovering from all this stuff, I felt like I needed to give back or do something. Um, and, and I happened to find Fresh Start Clubhouse on uh, um, the United Way's website. And, and I, I reached out and started volunteering. And then I was on the advisory board and then I helped them form their new nonprofit, chaired their board of directors for a year or two, you know? So like, and it was, it was part of the recovery process. It was, it was being around other people who knew about mental illness, could talk about it. And um, uh, for me, volunteering has always been very important. So being able to volunteer my time to, to benefit an organization or, or other people, you know? Okay, one more question here from the audience, and then we might have time for one on Zoom. And um, nope, we do not. So this is the last question. <laughs> and thanks very much for uh, uh, for what you you shared with us tonight. Um, I, I, as you know, I've I've had my own uh, experience with with mental illness and my own sort of trajectory with that. Um, I don't talk about it a lot. Um, and I had the same sort of issues with, uh, you know, being on the on the tenure clock and having to look like you are invincible when you're not, and it's 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 tough. And and it, one of the things I remember from that period is that, and this is this is leading to a question. I promise. Um, one of the things I remember from that period is that when I would, when I first went to a uh, um, uh, a psychiatrist to talk about whether I had something wrong with me, some some sort of mental illness or something else. I was given a list of things. And how many of these things apply to you? And I remember looking at that thinking, oh, God, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I mean, anybody could say any one of these things applies to them. <laughs> Diagnosis seems to be so far from a, a, an exact science in this area. And I think that ties into this notion that you're not worthy, that you're not suffering enough from this to, to set yourself out from what other people always experience, you know, what everybody, what all of us deal with. Now, my question is, I, I'm, I'm fully, fully on board with the idea of, of, of some doing what we can to destigmatize this and making this something that we can talk about. But when we do that, we also need to think more about, you know, the diagnostic side of this. That when when people, you know, a lot of people are stressed out, a lot of people are 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 really, really overloaded with work and so forth and so on. That doesn't mean they have mental illness. Right. So, so I was wondering if you could just share your own experience, like with the diagnostic side of this, like, like, how does that, how does what, how does my experience tie in with yours? Did you have similar things when you, when you, when you went in at first and, 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 and we were given this list of, do you ever feel sad? So do I'm, like, I, do I ever feel sad? Come yeah, I, I have seriously. like a, a, um, I know the diagnostic and statistics manual, like, inside and out, right, for the DSM, uh, which is used for diagnosing mental illnesses. And uh, I, I read it, and I read it, and I read it, and I read it, and I read it. And, and I was like, I can't possibly have bipolar one disorder because I've never had a manic episode. And now I told you I was laying in the grass and there was this thing coming out of the sky and whatever, you know, but like, no, that that's that's mild, you know, like, and, and so I, I just, I kept insisting that uh, my condition was mild and and that there's no other explanation for it. I'm, I'm here, I'm a professor at the University of Michigan. I, I don't have severe bipolar disorder with psychosis, uh, you know, but but so so you're, you're right. Like I think on, on the, the, maybe this is a question for the, the psychiatrist in the room, but you know, the, the what, what is, uh, what can be done in the field of, of psychiatry to make it a more precise science? Like I know that there's, there's, a lot that goes into the DSM manual and, and uh, you know, and, and a lot of fine tuning. And I read a book, it was like about the controversies of the DSM manual. And not that I bought any of the stuff that, that the lady wrote about, but I, I read it anyways, you know, because, you know, I, I'm just curious of hearing other viewpoints. 
Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know, um, but, but I, I know what you're talking about, which is that, that feeling of like, you know, it, it's all self-reported and there's bias because it's self-reported. Um, I'll give you another example, which is uh, when I was in high school, I was depressed and my parents said, you need to see a, 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 a doctor or a therapist or something to, to talk, talk about what's going on with you. And I said, no. So I went in there and I said, nothing's wrong with me. I'm fine. And they sent me home, you know, because I, I said it, you know, like it's it's all based on what you report. And and I, I think that um, that that's a whole other thing um, that's uh, not my field of expertise. So I don't feel qualified to talk about it. But I will say that I... I I struggled with similar things of uh, feeling like I, I couldn't possibly meet the criteria for this because of X, Y, Z, um, you know, and I, I think that that's part of just the imprecise nature of psychiatry in, in general. Um, but I, again, it's not my field. So I, I wish I could make changes and recommend things, you know, but. I think it was Heisenberg that said the universe is a series of approximations. And then, so they think physics, they have a series of challenges. Uh, yes. Yeah, 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 really, really. The whole of knowledge is, is a series of approximations. Yeah, yeah. And engineering is all about approximations. We're like, good enough factor safety. Like. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anne, for uh, this presentation and uh, congratulations on your book. I know you put a lot of hard work into it. So we are so pleased to celebrate this launch with you. And uh, so my name is Ava Armour. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm the student services assistant at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and a faculty member, or not a faculty member, wow, I wish, but. <laughs> do you, do you really wish? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> a member of the CEE DEI committee and then lead facilitator of disability culture at the University of Michigan. Um, we would once again like to thank our partners for this event. Um, the ADA team, the Americans with Disabilities Act team with within the Office of Equity, Civil Rights, and Title IX at the University of Michigan. Um, they supported our captioning today. Um, I would also like to thank um, Kate Miller with Screenline Captioning LLC um, for doing the live cart captioning for us. Um, and for those of you in person who are sticking around, we have coffee and tea and desserts available. Um, and I'll be signing copies of books that are available for purchase via credit card um, for $18. And I would just like to, again, thank, thank you, Anne, for um, presenting today and for um, all the hard work that went into your book. Um, it's a true, you're a true inspiration. <laughs> As a person with disabilities, I, I definitely uh, feel that. So, and thank you all very much for attending. Yeah.